Hey, prop. My first introduction to flying was uh, when I was about uh, 11 or 12 and we went to, the family went to Paris on a trident from Gatwick and the school rule then, uh, this was the, the Perth school in Cambridge, was that all boys should wear their uniforms at all times. So I had dutifully put on my school blazer which was very obvious, it was a purple and black striped affair and uh, sitting in the departure lounge uh, I was tapped on the shoulder by the co-pilot of this flight, who had been to the very same school. And he asked if I'd like to go onto the flight deck uh, during the flight, which I then did. And that was my first introduction. And for a young lad, it was fantastic. Um, all the bells and whistles and controls and the, the glamour of it and the, the complexity. Um, and that started really started my interest in aviation. Well, I started off um, when I was very, very young, actually, when my mother, for some reason, took, took me to an air show. And I saw some very interesting aircraft there. I must have been about five or six years old, that's all, and took an instant interest in aircraft and decided that that is what I wanted to go on and do. My dad had been a flight mechanic in the Royal Air Force during the Berlin airlift, and so I'm sure that my initial interest came from him. But then I grew up in the 1960s, which was a time of great... Um, advancement in aviation and space technology. There was always something in the news about new types of aircraft or space travel or whatever. Um, and uh, so that really compounded my interest. At school, um, I suppose at the age of about 14 or 15, we were uh, asked if we'd like to join the Combined Cadet Force at school, uh, which had three sections, Army, Navy and Air Force. And I chose the, the Air Force and uh, carried on uh, with my interest in flying and aircraft through the uh, Combined Cadet Force. Um, I was aware that in Cambridge there was a unit, the Five Air Experience Flight, running from Marshalls Airport, uh, which was giving uh, cadets in the area air experience flying. And I volunteered to go along, and uh, mostly at the weekends, to help with the programme of flying. The Air Cadets was a wonderful organisation because we got to do all kinds of activities virtually free of charge. But the reality was that the average cadet only got about half an hour in the air per year. There just weren't enough aeroplanes to go around. Some cadets were privileged enough to become staff cadets at uh, the local air experience flight, which for us, of course, was Cambridge. We as staff cadets were helpers there, effectively and we would give the safety briefing for the parachute exit from the aircraft and all that kind of thing and the other safety edges and we would help strap people into the aircraft too. So we did all these sort of um, donkey work. And in return for that, um, uh, often was given a flight in a chipmunk at the end of the day, which was uh, fantastic. 
So I learned a lot about flying through that organisation, the Air Experience Flight. My father was an AF pilot, so I was I was flying from about the age of nine in um, in disguise, with a bit of parachute that was much too big for me, and a big cushion, um, and uh, I had quite a few goes before I became a, a cadet. It was run by uh, one regular officer and uh, a lot of retired RAF volunteer reserve pilots, um, and uh, to fly with them was a great privilege. Uh, they were very senior guys and. Um, I learned a lot about flying from them, and this has helped me through uh, my flying career. Great characters, most of them. Almost all of them, with I think only about two exceptions, had war ribbons. They'd served in the war, and of course this was only 23 years after the war had ended, something like that. They all had fascinating stories. Um, Les Wagstaff, who was a sergeant pilot in the war, um, told us about being shot down in the Far East. Um, he, he blamed the Royal Navy for that. He, he seemed to think the Navy had shot him down, not the Japanese. But I suppose when you're being shot down, it's not totally clear who's actually pulling the trigger at the other end. Um, Les was somebody who we might say called a spade a spade. Um, in civilian life, he had a building company of some sort in Colchester. And uh, I re remember on one occasion, I was flying with him in the Husky and he let me do the takeoff. And then once we got into the air, I was having trouble with rudder control, which was never a, a great strength of mine. Um, so we were going left and right. And uh, then he advised me in um, the sort of terms that you might expect from a Colchester builder that this was in fact an aeroplane and not a bicycle. So I, I was left in no doubt about that. <laughs> they were great to fly with because they all had their own individual approach, which I suppose was um, more common in those days. and. Uh, you sort of learnt something from every one of them. Some loved aerobatics, some loved um, teaching you proper skills, straight and level, climbing, descending, things like that, which was great value but seemed boring at the time. Uh, so we had a lot of variety and a lot of um, interest. Mostly I flew with my father because, uh, I suppose, just naturally I flew with him, but the, the character characters particularly I think were Johnny Blackmore and Les Wagstaff, very different people. Johnny Blackmore was a very suave cigarette holder and um, and uh, quite I suppose what you call a flashy guy but um, a great character, very um, smooth and um, a, quite a drinker, excellent pilot, really excellent. His handling skills were, well they're memorable to me now, they were, they were superb. Apart from the, um, uh, the volunteer reserve pilots, who, as I was saying earlier on, had, be, had been in the Second World War, most of them, there were a few other, other pilots who, who we flew with who were much younger, and they were regular pilots who were between postings from one squadron to the next, uh, or, be, or after an operational conversion unit uh, before a squadron or whatever. They were a different breed who really liked throwing the aircraft around the sky, much more adventurous and high-spirited, um, but perhaps, perhaps lacked, lacked the discipline a bit of the more senior guys. Um, one of the uh, pilots who I got to know fairly well was Phil Meeson, who had, um, I think had been a staff cadet on the Air Experience flight, and then came back as a backlogger, the term given to these people between postings. And uh, he was great fun to fly with because he loved aerobatics. In fact, that's what he wanted to do most of the time. So for a young fellow to be thrown around the sky and doing amazing uh, manoeuvres with these chipmunk aircraft, it was great fun. Philip Meeson also was extremely good at it, um, he became the British aerobatic champion, I think more than once, and he taught me inverted spinning, which I'd never done before, which was pretty terrifying, uh, upside down and then going into a spin, uh, a bit like being in a washing machine, and he showed me how to recover, and I think I said, oh yes, I think I've got that, but I, I'm not sure I quite ever did. I've never been in an inverted spin <laughs> since, and I don't think I will start now. <laughs> eventually became a very successful businessman and, and now owns his own airline, believe it or not. Um, but uh, it was great fun flying with these backloggers who were the, the younger younger sort. We certainly did mix with some very distinguished pilots at Cambridge from the Second World War and beyond. 
Um, for me, though, I think um, one of the most inspirational groups was the other staff cadets, who were generally a few years older than me, and um, they looked like pilots, they dressed like pilots, flying kit, they had navigational devices and so on, they spoke like pilots. Uh, in fact, a number of them were already qualified. Um, Bob Lyons uh, already had his PPL, and he was about to go into the Air Force to train. Um, Kevin Mulhern had gone by that time to, to the Navy, I never knew him. Um, there was Pete Nightingale, who had been uh, a staff cadet, but by the time I got there, was already at medical school um, and in the University Air Squadron. But he used to come back at the weekends. So it was a very, um, the bar was set very high there. Um, it was a bit like the experience of going up to the sixth form, where suddenly you didn't have slackers around you. You had people that were really taking this seriously. They were there because they wanted to be there and they were moving steadily towards their goals. In uh, 1971, I joined the Air Force. I went to Henlow, got a, my uh, commission from RF Henlow. I then went to uh, RF Linton on Ouse to do the basic flying course on Jet Provost aircraft, the Mark III and the Mark V. For a number of reasons, the Air Force didn't work out for me. I was in it for about two years, um, but I was uh, eventually rejected. My time, I have to say, in the Air Force, although, you know, the wonderful training on the Jet Provost aircraft was not a happy time for me. And um, on the day that I drove southbound along the A1 in my new, rusty, very rusty second-hand car, I think I had a smile of relief on my face. <laughs> built up a load of turboprop flying hours on Beach King Airs and uh, aircraft like that. I then joined Bryman Airways and I was with them for about 10 years and I loved it with them, wonderful company. And I was sent to London City Airport as one of the sort of pi pioneering pilots there. And we pioneered the steep approaches and the short runway and um, all that kind of stuff. And they were really wonderful flying days, there's no doubt about that. It was um, a whole new culture of people that we sort of built up on our own. And we became, all of us, really there, very close friends. What it did for me, number five air experience flight, was that it, it, ra it, it raised my um, ambitions enormously. I felt quite inspired by the people around me at the weekends. I've had quite a long and very varied civilian flying career since then, especially with Bryman Airways, especially with Air UK. And um, I've had a very rewarding career. The chipmunk felt like an airplane and it smelt like an airplane 
and they were extremely well maintained. They were lovely to be in. Of course, you were in your little cockpit all on your own, so you weren't sitting next to the pilot. You were sitting there um, in isolation. It had a sliding canopy, parachute. Parachute drill was a big thing, so um, everybody was briefed carefully about how to um, wear a parachute and how to use it and how to get out of the aeroplane in an emergency. The Chipmunk was a delight to fly. The view was somewhat limited from the back cockpit because it was a tailwheel aeroplane so uh, the front wing got in the way for a chap who wasn't very tall. Um, but actually that was all to the good. It made you fly precisely and use good visual references um, and it certainly uh, needed careful handling. Um, Later on, with experience, we were allowed to um, do takeoffs and landings, and uh, that was a voyage of discovery. Uh, the AEF started my career because it gave me a really good start in, um, in light aircraft flying, which uh, spurred me on to do a PPL. Um, I did about 100 hours of the AEF, so um, I became what was called a self-improver, which means that you um, progress uh, by gaining qualifications eventually to a commercial licence. So I did a PPL at Cambridge Air Club, um, built some hours enough to become an instructor, did that course at Peterborough and then instructed at various places, Cambridge being the one that I enjoyed most, Cambridge Air Club and White Waltham um, and uh, Fenland in, um, in, up near the Wash in the Fens. And uh, um, then I became a commercial pilot and uh, flew like piston-engined aeroplanes, um, gradually more sophisticated, um, pressurised and turbocharged and so forth, then turboprops and then light jets and then I had a career change and joined the CAA as a, um, a, a flight examiner which was something I'd always wanted to do um, but really wasn't uh, generally qualified for. They wanted people who'd been ex-military, um, ex-central flying school instructors but they sort of um, took on an experiment in my case and decided that it would be a good thing to diversify and not have too many of the normal stereotype. So I got in, luckily really, rather than through any personal attributes and um, I loved the career and I stayed there for 30 years until retirement. And when I retired I thought I'd be um, doing a little bit of instructing in my spare time but actually the CA asked if I would carry on doing my job as a consultant for a short period of time and I'm still doing it. So that's a part-time job and I'm able to fit in the instructing around that. So really I'm getting everything that I'd like now. Some free time, CA work, which I've always enjoyed, and um, some flying instructing as well. I think I would probably have sought a career in aviation anyway because my father had been a pilot in the Air Force and the VR and um, I, it was always my sort of primary interest to the detriment of academic achievement. Um, but the AF certainly was the biggest um, leg up that I could possibly have wished for or, or um, had anywhere else in my career really. A hundred hours in chipmunks with all sorts of different people teaching me all sorts of different things and um, passing on their wealth of experience. It was a, a really good start. It really did help with the PPL. Um, it, most, of the, most of the exercises I'd done, done before uh, and a good good many others besides, so I was very lucky really. Well Steve Grantham was younger, I think probably about four years younger than me, so he um, started flying with the AEF <coughs> excuse me, um, a little later but he overlapped and uh, I always admired him because he hitchhiked up from Stevenage or wherever he lived and um, every Sunday he was there early, he was always smart, his uniform was pressed like a, um, a sort of 30 year old serviceman um, and uh, immaculate, his boots were immaculate, and he was a really keen guy. Um, didn't, not pushy. Um, he uh, he just did the staff cadet job really well. He was a person terribly, 
keen and interested in aviation and flying. He was a staff cadet with us, but he had no hesitation in asking anybody that came along with an aircraft if he could have a flight with them. And he succeeded during his school days um, quite successfully at that. He also, because of, uh, of his membership of the Air Cadets, uh, he was able to use the Air Force to get him plenty of flight in quite high-performance aircraft. I knew he flew in a Lightning twice. He managed to get all sorts of interesting flights as a cadet in um, jet fighters and jet trainers and pretty much everything that he wanted to fly in, he succeeded, except that he never got in a Phantom, which was the one he really wanted to fly in. And he was a lovely guy to um, chat to. And he was quite a character as it turned out. He was reticent, but he was a great character. And he bought himself a motorbike and grew uh, quite long flowing hair despite his immaculate uniform. And um, he, was, uh, a, he was very keen to join the Air Force. Steve wasn't from, in any sense, a privileged background, but his great strength was that he had flying in his blood. And uh, certainly from the age of 14 or 15, it was all he talked about. Um, he was completely taken up with the idea of being a pilot in the Air Force, and he would have loved to have been a fast jet pilot, I know that. Um, for whatever reason, that wasn't to be. But he did eventually join and had a, um, a long, successful ground career as, a, I think, an electronic engineer or an electrical engineer. But he was undeterred, and uh, eventually um, he did find another route into professional flying. So since he left the Air Force, he um, has had a, a flying career in America, which has been very varied and, um, and I would say, distinguished, really. Um, and that's where he still is. It's really an object lesson in perseverance, which um, I hope he'll be telling us about at some point. County, and I drive the main road, searching in the sun for another overload. I hear you singing in the wire. I can hear you through the wire. I spent three or four years with five air experience flight, flying chipmunks. I absolutely loved flying and wanted to be a pilot. The chipmunk was a wonderful aircraft to fly. It was built as a trainer and as such it wasn't very stable. If you wanted to fly it well, you had to work hard at it. If you wanted to hold out a tune heading, you had to work at it. It didn't sit there like a modern day trainer. You had to fly it. Pilots were very generous in their in the time they would devote to teaching us what we wanted to know. If we wanted to learn something, they would teach us. If we just wanted to fly around and do aerobatics, they would do that. And there were a number of other staff cadets at 5 AEF, quite a few of us. We had a great camaraderie. We were friends, we worked together well, performed well as a group, as a team. Applied to the Royal Air Force three times and went to Biggin Hill for three times to go through the selection procedure. It wasn't accepted, so I really wanted to serve in the Royal Air Force, so I joined this ground crew. I became a radar technician and was posted to Hollington to work on the Buccaneers. After that I went to Larbrook, then to Chivana, to working on the Hawk. And then my last posting was for about 10 years on the Nimrod at St Morgan. I completed about 13 years and I still really wanted to fly, so I decided to give my notice. I gave 18 months notice and used my resettlement course to go and learn to fly in America. Then I moved to America permanently and became a professional pilot and worked as a flight instructor for about, uh, I would guess, two or three, maybe 4,000 hours, a long time. I think Steve met some very interesting people and high-profile people during his career 
in the US. He one time met Harrison Ford at a flying school in Kansas, and he actually instructed Joe Montana, who is probably not a household name in Europe, but is reckoned to be one of the greatest American footballers of all time. And eventually he got a break and was offered a job as a Sabre liner pilot. Uh, also flew a Gulfstream G1, Gulfstream G2, a Hawker, and a lot of times co-piloting a number of jets, delivering them around the country. One of the jobs that Steve had in the US, which he doesn't talk about very much, was as uh, one of the personal pilots to Wayne Newton, who was a world famous, still is a world famous entertainer in the kind of uh, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin ilk. He worked for him for some time, uh, ferrying him around on tour, flying a Gulfstream 1, I think, and later a Gulfstream 2. He always emphasises how well he was treated by Wayne Newton, who would always give them uh, passes to the best restaurants, uh, insist they, they stayed in luxury suites, um, backstage passes, and um, even gave them the use of his limousine while he was performing. One thing that Wayne Newton really liked about Steve was his flexibility, not just in terms of flying, but uh, also the way that he contributed to the, the touring setup. And uh, on one um, legendary occasion, Wayne had laryngitis and couldn't sing at Vegas one night. And so Steve, without ceremony, went round to the dressing room and got himself a tux and uh, was up on stage in no time and um, gave a, what by all accounts was a very passable rendition of My Way to, to great applause. Um, uh, and that has become part of not just aviation, but entertainment folklore. I was on the road for three weeks, home for one week, on the road for three I was never at home, I really wanted to come home at the weekends and spend time with my family. I've worked for 22 years now for flight safety as a Hawker instructor. And because I've got this goofy accent, he decided I'd be perfect for a British aircraft. So I, I transitioned to the Hawker, I've worked on the Hawker, instructed in the Hawker program for the last 22 years. One thousand. About 10 years ago, I started to have some strange symptoms. I couldn't write my name anymore, I couldn't do my shirt up. I couldn't talk very well, I'd had a lot of problems. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, so I lost my medical. Couldn't fly anymore. Now I can only work in a simulator, but I enjoy that immensely.
<laughs> he didn't um, fly to the moon, but he walked to Mars. He certainly walked to Mars. Um, it's a very inspirational story of uh, how he eventually won through um, by way of perseverance. Um, uh, another example of, of, of the benefits of having been in, in the experience flight at, at Cambridge. And the Wichita line is still on the line. So when I left school and went to university, um, I ended up at Cambridge to study medicine and uh, transitioned to the University Air Squadron there which again flew chipmunks and uh, so I was already uh, well acquainted with the aircraft and already had a private pilot's license so I managed to fly at Cambridge for three years and then in London for a further two years on the Bulldog um, through the University Air Squadron. So again the Air Force helped me and uh, trained me and uh, in the air squadron my flying went up to a different level with aerobatics, uh, formation flying, low flying, instrument flying and that sort of thing. So uh, at the end of my time at Cambridge and at London um, I would got to a fairly decent standard of flying and um, was very tempted to join the Air Force uh, as, a, as a regular. But by then I would um, had qualified as a doctor and I had to make a a very important decision whether I wanted to do the flying or medicine and uh, it was difficult. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a job available called a medical officer pilot whereby uh, doctors were trained to squadron standard and could fly uh, from Farnborough primarily uh, doing research and development studies on the latest edition of RAF aircraft. So I had a couple of uh, weeks with the unit at Farnborough, uh, the Institute of Aviation Medicine, with the prospect possibly of, of joining the Air Force as a medical officer pilot. And this was a serious consideration. Um, the Air Force I think only had about four or five of them at the time. And um, I got to the stage of being interviewed by the Chief Medical Officer who said that um, he would be happy for me to join the Air Force and the next time a vacancy came up as a medical officer pilot um, I would be in pole position to apply. But sadly there was a fatality at Farnborough. One of the pilots, one of the, one of the doctor pilots, died in a meteor crash and that seemed to raise the eyebrows of the bean counters in London who must have queried why doctors were flying these fast jets and uh, helicopters and all sorts of things uh, at probably vast expense. And from that moment onwards they cut back the recruitment of medical officer pilots uh, so that in fact they didn't recruit any more so had I gone into the Air Force I probably wouldn't have had a career as a what they used to call a flying doctor so I, I didn't ever join the Air Force properly I'd had five years in the RAFVR and um, pursued my flying in the civilian world by by flying privately and over the last many years I've had my own aircraft and I've been very happy with that so I've kept my flying going but uh, I'm forever grateful to the Air Force, the Air Experience Flight, the Combined Cadet Force, the University Air Squadron for giving me the opportunities as a young man, which uh, are not so commonly available today, I fear. So uh, I was very lucky, as were all of my chums. Every time I saw a uh, Air Force aircraft, usually a fast jet, a Harrier or a Tornado, flying overhead. I used to gaze wistfully to the sky and think, yeah, I could have been doing that 
but I haven't. And But probably on balance, it was the right decision to make for me. Um, I've enjoy, I had a, I've had a very interesting and stimulating career in medicine. Um, but I've managed to combine the two. I've, I've, I still go, still go flying uh, every week or two. And um, so I've managed to keep that interest going. But yes, uh, the, the sight of fast jets flying overhead really was very tempting. <laughs>
um, search and rescue to becoming a very young instructor in the Navy. He always had a fistful of stories about life on the ocean waves and life in the Navy and flying and um, he was a great character and a very successful pilot, highly regarded uh, in the naval and the helicopter world. Uh, when his career, when his uh, commission uh, finished, he um, was asked by the Buckingham Palace to teach the then Duchess of York to fly helicopters. I never really met him properly, but I do recall one Saturday morning when he came back for a visit to catch up with his mates and have a flight in a chipmunk and so on. And uh, I remember looking at him there in the um, uh, crew room, dressed in his fleet air arm flying kit, which seemed to be all kind of bristling with naval regalia. And I thought then, you know, gosh, this is really, um, this is success, this is really serious stuff, you know, because there he was, 18 or 19 years old, already a commissioned officer and um, learning to fly Sea Kings, um, uh, or at least progressing that way. Um, so it was very, very impressive and uh, you know, made you think what, what could be achieved if you put your mind to it, really. When he left the Navy, he joined a, um, a, a prestigious um, helicopter operator, Air Hansen. But after many years there, he um, decided that fixed wing was a better career opportunity. So he got his fixed wing license and uh, joined British Airways. Uh, but he continued to fly helicopters on a freelance basis to help his children through a private education, help fund the costs of that. Kevin used to fly loads of high profile people. I think he flew ABBA and lots of people, lots of politicians and probably royalty and that sort of thing. The thing I've always felt with helicopter flying, although it certainly didn't apply to Pud's attitude to it because he was so professional and careful, was that um, it was less regulated, well that's perhaps the wrong word, it was, it was less assured than fixed wing flying. In, in fixed wing flying you're normally operating to an airport with approach aids and um, very clearly defined minima where if you don't see the airfield you go around and you follow a set procedure and it's all safe. In helicopters if you're going to uh, an off airfield site, a strip or a somebody's stately home or whatever or a, a landing field somewhere, um, there are no such safeguards. But that was very unfortunate. Uh, I particularly was very s sad about it. Poor Pud was killed on a, uh, a nasty windy night in Ireland. Um, in a, in a helicopter, um, and I can't remember the exact reasons, but the awful thing was that Pud was killed in his early 40s um, with some other people and left a, a widow and two young children, uh, very young children, I think they were sort of um, around about the age of 10, 9, 11, something like that. It was just an awful thing to happen because he was always so careful and professional. Um.
I always think that uh, 1969 was a very significant year in aviation and, of course, space travel. We always associate 1969 with the first moon landing in July of that year. But really, the whole thing kicked off much earlier, around um, Christmas of 1968, when NASA had sent three men into orbit around the moon, Borman, Lovell and Anders, on Apollo 8, to test the hardware and um, to... um, uh, check that they had tracking capability and that type of thing. And there was that defining moment when they read from the book of Genesis on uh, uh, Christmas Eve. And I, I still get goosebumps when I hear that even now. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a merry Christmas, and God bless all of you. But then on to uh, 1969 itself, there were three more Apollo missions leading up to the landing of Apollo 11. Um, And in March of that year, um, the Concorde flew for the first time, the French Concorde, and then very shortly afterwards, the British Concorde. Uh, The Harrier jump jet came into service with the Royal Air Force. Um, And in May of that year, the Daily Mail sponsored a transatlantic air race to commemorate the first... uh, flight across the Atlantic by Alcock and Brown. The east-west leg of the race was won by the Royal Air Force Harrier, flown by squadron leader Tom Lucky Thompson, who started off at the top of the GPO tower, or what we now know as the telecom tower, and uh, was whisked to St Pancras, where there was uh, a Harrier waiting in a disused coal yard, and he took off and headed off to the US, refuelled multiple times, and landed somewhere on the East River Drive in New York and then had to be taken up to the Empire State Building by another motorbike and then up to the top and and so he won his uh, leg of the race. So really to be alive at that time if you had any kind of interest in aviation at all it was a boy's own dream. Um, It was also the year that I turned 13 and you had to be 13 and a half to uh, join the Air Cadets. Um, In the autumn of that year there was an open day at Luton Airport and my dad took me over there. We lived not far from there. And uh, so there were various activities you could do. And one of them was you could have a pleasure flight in a Boeing 737 for one pound, 20 minute pleasure flight for one pound. That was in one of the original old uh, 737s. And uh, I I can remember my poor dad standing, looking at this billboard, uh, trying to think whether he could afford two pounds for us both to go on, on this flight um, we weren't uh, a poor family but um, we were quite a large family and you could do a lot with two quid in 1969 but anyway he, he stood there jingling his, po- his uh, change in his pocket and eventually he said oh come on let's go and uh, and I still remember very vividly the, the sense of exhilaration as the uh, uh, aircraft accelerated for takeoff and then the way that the the world um, tipped away at uh, a crazy angle of 45 degrees, it seemed, at the time. And also at that time, I became 13 and a half, which meant I was finally eligible to join the Air Cadet, so it was the most natural thing for me to do. After I left 5 AEF and subsequently left school, I found that I hadn't done very well at all. In fact, I did very poorly at school. Um, partly because I was at Cambridge at the weekends uh, learning to fly rather than doing simultaneous equations at home, as my dad used to remind me. But I certainly didn't have the qualifications to go into the Air Force or the Navy as a pilot, as I'd always hoped to. So I drifted for a few years and wasn't really sure what to do. But I used to look back on those times at Cambridge and remember the characters who'd got to where they wanted to be through sheer application and to get into professional flying uh, does uh, require a lot of grit and determination. Um, and I suppose somehow something of that must have rubbed off on me because uh, eventually I did get my education together and then life took a turn and I finished up going into medicine rather than flying. Um, and uh, that's been a great privilege and I'm at the tail end of my career as a GP now. Um, there's no direct link between flying and medicine, of course, but. Um, Having occupied that high-achieving environment when I was very young, 
uh, did have something to do with uh, propelling me forward in my own career. I was in the University Air Squadron, we, we um, were trained in uh, the basics of formation flying and uh, very, very good fun to do that, very hard work and very difficult to do, to keep in close formation, uh, required a huge amount of concentration. And that was 50 years ago and I haven't done any since, until very recently when I was given the opportunity to fly in formation again with a chipmunk out of Duxford uh, for some uh, aerial filming and uh, that took me right back. And that was great fun to see another aircraft close up in formation, dancing on one's wingtip. Uh, it was uh, very nostalgic, and I thoroughly enjoyed that flight.
I mean, there was one point in my life when I thought, well, I'll just join the Air Force, and if I had to become a chef, then I'll just do that. But the fiber experience flight inspired me to become um, a pilot in the Air Force. As, as lots of us have sort of said, it'd be really nice now at our sort of time in life to sort of thank them for what they did for us in the past because it was really really sort of inspiring I guess um, doing all of that flying and uh, being exposed to things that we wouldn't normally be exposed to had we not been in the cadets. I was so inspired by the pilots I flew with at 5 AF and the experiences that I had in flying the aircraft. I had to be a pilot, I had to fly. It took me quite a while to accomplish it. It took me 13 years before I could actually become a professional pilot. But I eventually made it and the inspiration was 5 AF and its pilots. Somehow, it was the experience of having rubbed shoulders with a group of young men who were really reaching out for a life less ordinary, which finally motivated me to try to do something useful with life, rather than just let it slip by, which I think it very easily could have done if I hadn't had that um, few years at 5AF. Um, so I'll always be grateful to the, to the pilots and to the other cadets and everybody else there for having had that um, uh, really life-altering experience. None of us from those days fell by the wayside, I would like to feel, in our development as youngsters trying to formulate a, a career path for us. All of us young lads who were exposed to this, I think benefited from this structure, which was uh, neither school nor home. These pilots were extremely patient with us and um, very happy to let us push ourselves to our own limits. Um, really, you know, at their risk, which I was, in, when I think back, I was, I was very impressed with.
Yeah, when I was young, my mum said, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, mum, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot. And she said, son, you have to choose one or the other. That's the end of the joke. Okay guys, so how did this idea of putting a, a film about uh, our life at 5AF come about? Well, almost a year ago now, we're in, uh, where are we now, December, um, and in, right after Christmas, early January, out of the blue, I got a, um, an email from Ed Luckett, who I'd known from years ago, both from Stevenage and from the AF. Um, Ed's now a retired airline pilot. Anyway, he was um, uh, telling me about this five AEF reunion at Cambridge. And uh, so I thought, well, that'd be interesting because these were people that, you know, I hadn't seen for 45 plus years, really, most of them. Um, and uh, so I thought, well, maybe there'll be, you know, the odd familiar face over there. But anyway, I turned up to the Eagle in Cambridge and virtually everybody that I remembered from that time was there, you know, one after another turned up. And, um, and it struck me afterwards you know, they'd all had very interesting careers in flying, and I'd had a little bit of training in filmmaking. I, it's just a sideline, really, but I, I did a little bit of training in that. And it's always difficult to find a good topic um, to make a film about. They can be very boring, you know, amateur films. <laughs> and I just thought this would be an excellent topic because there was, you know, the interest of all these varied lives and their backgrounds um, in aviation. Um, and it would be a very good thing visually because there'd be aircraft and uh, you know old photographs and, and and that type of thing. So really, that's that was how the idea came to me. Um, and then I uh, I met Bob for lunch shortly after that, and I put the idea to him, and there was a kind of a pregnant pause, <laughs> and I thought, gosh, I've said something very silly here, you know. But anyway, um, he was on board straight away, and. And then, well, perhaps, Bob, you can uh, enlarge on what happened after that. Yes, we briefly discussed it and agreed to meet again sometime to just deal with the details. But anyway, in the meantime, um, I said that I would go and visit um, the current, uh, well, chief flying instructor of the Cambridge Aero Club at Marshalls, a chap called Terry Holloway, and uh, see what he could do to help us prepare a video based around all the old familiar features of the airport that were there. So I spoke to him and uh, we had qu quite a good conversation and he said that he would get the local media involved as well, you know, the local radio station perhaps and the local newspapers. He said they would also be very interested to come along and, um, you know, I think he saw it really is an opportunity to present marshals in the present day as well. So it was quite good positive advertising for them. Anyway, that, um, that occasion that we were all going to meet up at Cambridge Airport never really came about uh, because he wasn't available at the time. And um, also we could only get together really at a weekend and uh, there was no civil flying there to do with it the weekends either. So what we did, um, Mike and I, um, we did some filming of the outside of Marshalls Airport, just along the sort of boundary fence. And uh, we'd also agreed to um, get an X5A AF Chipmunk aircraft involved. And Terry Holloway knew who one of the part owners of that was and gave me some contact details. So I got in touch with him. And then we all met up at Duxford, um, and the flying was done from there. 
Actually, that, the Duxford did actually turn out to be a very good backdrop for it, but I think better than Marshalls yes. would have been, because the day that we filmed there happened to be the day after the, the major air display in September, and so there were, um, uh, you know, uh, any number of uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes and other vintage aeroplanes all lined up there, and then uh, Pete's and uh, Howard's aeroplanes parked next to them, you know, so it was... Yes, it, as it turned out, it was it was a very good location, and um, the uh, part owner of the Chipmunk, um, Howard Cook, he came along uh, exactly at the appointed time, and he gave a very good sort of professional briefing, um, dealing mostly with uh, the route where the filming would take place, and flight safety. Um, uh, things to be discussed as well, and everybody went. Pete went off in his own aircraft, in his Joe Dell, with uh, Mike and his camera, and um, Howard Cook went off in the chipmunk with uh, Rob Yates in the back. He got little handheld cameras too, and the filming took about 20 minutes, half an hour, and actually turned out to be a very great presentation of our old flying days from Cambridge. And it, um, that and the filming at Marshalls Airport has actually formed the basis of the video, really. And so, so, Mike, as part of this film, you went over to see Steve Grantham in the States. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, that, that was a great uh, uh, coup, really, because <laughs> um, I hadn't seen Steve for about 15 years. I saw him when he was over here briefly about 15 years ago. And then uh, when this idea came together, um, I uh, sent him an email and then didn't get a reply for some time and realised I was using the wrong email address. I thought he just wasn't interested. But anyway, when I did finally contact him, he was full of enthusiasm for it. And so I thought it would be uh, a nice idea to go over there and film him. So um, he was, uh, it was all on for that. So I went out to Wichita and uh, um, he and his wife, uh, Jeanette, uh, with great hospitality, put me up um, for a few days there, and we and Steve, as we know, is a, a, a simulator instructor now in Wichita. Which is, Wichita is a, um, a sort of an aviation hub, you know, in terms of training and uh, production. And so we, we we spent hours. We spent probably seven or eight hours in the simulator, mostly messing around, but <laughs> but also uh, getting some good um, shots in there. And then, of course, um, Steve is coming over for the for the reunion in January. Um, so the, the whole thing, really, though, you know, there's there's a number of um, major elements to it, which just worked out like a dream. You know, the air to air filming, going out to meet Steve, and then um, having everybody come together and being so interested in in pulling this project off. So it's, it's been a good year. <laughs> and as you can see, we've all sort of interviewed each other just so that we can express brief reflections on our days as staff cadets and it's all coming together very very nicely so it was it was a very good idea of Mike's to think that it will make um, a good video to present on the internet and I'm sure it will. Well I mean I think the great thing was that everybody came on board very quickly you know um, were very keen to uh, and they've been very long suffering you know with repeated interviews and uh, uh, chopping and changing the stuff. Um, I, I should say, with, with the air, the air-to-air -air filming, that, I think that was a great success. It was. Uh, uh, I couldn't quite believe that that had come together so well, and uh, um, the air-to-air -air shots were very good. I, sh I should mention that I was actually shoehorned into Pete's aeroplane. It was uh, <laughs> that was an experience in itself. But uh, um, yeah, so it's it's, it's been a great. Uh, if nothing else, it's been a great social thing, really, because we're meeting up more after all these years. And OK, well, thank you very much, guys, and thanks for your tenacity in uh, pulling this together. <laughs> I think uh, Mike decided to call it uh, Cambridge Flypast, I think. OK. Well, which, I think which is a good name, actually. I think yeah. you decided that, actually. Well, no, well, no, no, no I suggested Cambridge Cadet Flypast, because right. I thought that's CCF, you see. Yes, but, indeed. But, yeah. but, but, but I agree that... The cadet word is a bit, yeah. is a bit excessive, really. Yeah. Um, well, but, but, but it's a nice name, I think. Um, fly past being two Pass. words. Yeah, yeah.